Gresham College presents Empire from Conquest to Control by Professor Richard J. Evans, FBA. Well, good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. In 1884, the Berlin Conference, here it is, that set off the scramble for colonies in Africa and other parts of the world, <coughs> laid down the basic principle that in order to establish the formal right of rule over a colony, a European power had to establish what it called effective occupation. But of course here you had to read the small print, which said that this only really applied to coastal areas <clears throat> to the time where, in fact, the main concern of most European states, uh, particularly in Africa. The hinterland of the continental Africa, which is the subject of the main phase of the scramble, was a different matter. Here, European states drew straight lines across the map with an almost complete disregard for geographical features, delimiting the territories they claimed from one another, but leaving them still to be brought under real control. And in many ways, the story of colonization in the 1890s and 1900s is the story of how European empires tried to convert paper colonies into real ones. Although it goes back further, and in this lecture I shall be ranging across the 19th century uh, to show how this process happened in different parts, in particular of, of, of Africa at different times. So in my last lecture I noted how, in some cases, the attempt to acquire new colonies met with failure, most notably with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1896, and similarly the Boxer Rebellion in China deterred European powers from converting treaty ports into hubs of real colonization further inland. But there were, these, these were, I think, exceptions. Most of Africa, as you can see from the map, many parts of the Pacific, European powers moved to establish their control over the land they claimed as their own. What drove them to do so were, in the 1880s and particularly 90s, 90s two uh, separate but ultimately intermeshing influences. The first of these is ideological. The 1880s ushered in the age of empire. There, uh, these were the decades of imperialism, a word that first entered the English language in the 1870s, and was, as Jay Hobson noted, critic of imperialism in 1900, on everybody's lips, he said. It was used to denote the most powerful movement in the current politics of the Western world. Imperialism was po uh, propagated by governments who are keen to gain popular support for the principle of maintaining, usually at some cost, their overseas possessions. And the cult of empire began <coughs> in Britain already in the 1870s with the proclamation of Queen Victoria as Empress of India. Within a few years, royal and royal uh, uh, ceremonies in Britain, including Queen Victoria's golden and diamond jubilees, the coronation of King Edward VII in 1902, were featuring Maharajas and colonial troops. As the Daily Mail reported in 1897, the diamond jubilee procession displayed, and I quote, new types, new realms at every couple of yards, an anthropological museum, a living gazetteer of the British Empire. With them came their English officers, whom they obey and follow like children. Always good for a quote, the Daily Mail. I <coughs> rather imagine the uh, Diamond Jubilee procession this year will be rather different. <laughs> Huge publicity was given to the ceremonies. Durbars, as they were called, held in India in 1877 to proclaim Queen Victoria Empress of India, and in 1902 and 1911 to celebrate the coronations of her successors. 1902 saw the inauguration of Empire Day in Britain, <coughs> especially directed at schools. Imperial propaganda <coughs> could be found everywhere, right with bookstalls, political meetings, novels, magazines, history books, even in the Empire Plate manufactured for the Diamond Jubilee in 1897. The coronation of Edward VII in particular was given a strong imperial flavor. To celebrate, as a contemporary put it, the recognition by a free democracy of a hereditary crown as a symbol 
of the worldwide dominant dominion of their race. And international expositions, tradition inaugurated, of course, by Britain's Great Exhibition of 1851, began to include colonial pavilions, 18 of them in all, at the Paris Exposition of 1889, clustering round the Eiffel Tower, which was specially built for the occasion. This is the scene outside the colonial pavilions with, as you can see, there were colonial types sitting around. Colonial museums opened in most European countries to display looted artifacts. Most remarkably, perhaps, began to include native villages among their exhibits. Uh, uh, these were also um, held in zoos. Uh, Hagenbeck's Tier Park, for example, in Hamburg, an enterprising private, large private zoo, uh, showed a series of African and other indigenous groups to gawping crowds of visitors who, at a safe distance, to avoid the danger of physical contact, observe the primitive world that Germany had uh, conquered in Africa. Here's Hagenbeck's uh, African village, or the people who were uh, supposed to live in it. In Belgium, in the 1880s and 90s, exhibitions were held, including a typical Congolese village, where imported Africans were told to do what they normally did at home, which mostly wasn't much, since what they normally did at home would have been to go out hunting or uh, work in the fields, which they couldn't do there. A pool uh, was provided and stocked with fish, and spectators threw coins in for the Congolese to dive for. Sometimes they threw in bottles of gin and brandy, too, to make them drunk. Sometimes stages were set up for the men to reenact battles with spears and shields. The Congolese had to go round uh, in a, half naked in a display of authenticity. In cold weather, many of them became ill and some died. Such displays were, of course, put on to underline European superiority. So there's no interest, for example, in getting the villagers to make or display artifacts or put on musical events. In a similar way, uh, Buffalo Bill is enormously popular Wild West show, which toured Europe at this time, demonstrated the inferiority of Native Americans, doomed to extinction in battle with the better armed forces of civilization, uh, acquiring a certain amount of um, uh, satirical humor in this American satirical magazine. While European notions of superiority were caricatured, but also, of course, reaffirmed in a way in cartoons of the time. Here's one portraying the new governor of German East Africa as a new idol, replacing or perhaps add, just adding to the ones already worshipped by the native heathens. All this served to enlist the middle classes and potentially the working classes too in patriotic enthusiasm for the ideals of empire, a tactic that's more successful in some countries, notably I think Britain, than in others. It didn't really work very well in Germany. The press followed colonial campaigns closely and whipped up jingoistic sentiment expressed in such events as the triumph of the British over the Ashanti, seen here in the uh, uh, Illustrated London News. Imperial enthusiasm reached new heights with the emergence of mass circulation newspapers, yes, the Daily Mail, fueling events such as the popular celebrations in London at the relief of Mafeking during the Boer War. The age of high imperialism, in other words, coincided with the coming of the age of mass communications in the popular press, and each, of course, fed off the other one. The events of the Boer War pointed to the second major force, apart from imperialist ideology, driving forward European powers' establishment of control over their colonies. And that was the actions and policies of the men on the ground, in the colonies themselves. For most of the 19th century, as I've already said in this series, it was missionaries, traders, and explorers who brought in the colonizing state to further their interests or more frequently to rescue them when they got into trouble with indigenous people. And in some colonies, however, in the age of high imperialism, European settlers began arriving in ever increasing numbers, indeed had done so well before the age of high imperialism dawned. Uh, if the land was suitable, then uh, and the pressures to emigrate from European countries was high enough, then already in the 1820s, 1830s, and above all, of course, the hungry 40s, uh, people emigrated where it seemed suitable. And this had huge implications for the creation of empire. They began to arrive and, uh, and with or without the approval of the colonial states, seized land for cattle farming, or in Africa, rubber or palm oil plantations. And the clashes 
Such actions sparked were amongst the most violent in the history of European empire. Uh, and I'm going to devote most of this, uh, empire to, most of this um, lecture to a, a, a comparison of um, uh, violence in uh, the British Empire through the 19th century uh, and uh, comparing that with the German Empire, which was created very much in the age of high imperialism, which I'll begin with, uh, and focus here particularly on German Southwest Africa, now, now Namibia. Southwest Africa began in a classic way uh, that Bismarck wanted uh, as a protectorate run by a limited company. But as early as 1888, the company failed and the state had to take over. It was just not good for German prestige for Bismarck to turn his back, even though he rather wanted to. Much of the land was semi-arid uh, or, or pastoral and was inhabited by nomadic cattle herders of the Herero Nama tribes. And in the 1890s, German settlers arrived and began setting up cattle ranches fencing off the land from the nomads, whose livelihood was also being undermined by an outbreak of a fatal cattle disease, the Rinderpest, at the end of the 1890s. And the mounting pressure of land seizures by the colonial uh, farmers, um, ratified by the colonial administration, eventually led to attacks on German farmers, resulting in about 150 deaths by 1904 when the attacks reached a peak. Kaiser Wilhelm II always won to... Uh, uh, be very uh, touchy about his prestige and that of his country, which of course he considered to be one of the same thing, took this as a provocation, even a personal insult. Germany was not going to be humiliated in 1904 as Italy had been in Ethiopia eight years before. So 14,000 German troops were dispatched from Berlin under General Lothar von Trotha, a hardline Prussian army officer with previous colonial experience. I know, he said, that African tribes yield only to violence. To exercise this violence with crass terrorism and even with gruesomeness was and is my policy. After defeating a Herero force at Waterberg, Trotter announced any Herero found inside the German frontier with or without gun or cattle will be executed. Herero cattle herders caught in the action were shot or hanged on the spot. A few, uh, 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 and the remaining men, along with Herrera women and children, were driven into the desert and left to starve. And the few who emerged alive from the desert uh, were little more than skeletons, as this contemporary photograph shows. The chief of the general staff in Berlin, Alfred von Schlieffen, famous, of course, for the Schlieffen plan, which launched the First World War, uh, enthralled, like all Prussian officers, to the supposedly Clausewitzian doctrine that the aim of a war had to be the total annihilation of the enemy force, praised von Trotter's campaign as brilliant, especially his use of the desert to complete what he called the previously extermination of the Herero nation. And popular commemorative books uh, were printed celebrating the triumph of uh, German uh, army arms in the war. He was German Southwest Africa, uh, pictures from the wars against the Herreros and the Hottentots. Uh, and there's, you can see, a classic image there of the, uh, the, the African begging for mercy or giving his obeisance. It's not quite clear which. Back in Germany, the socialists and the Catholic Center Party politicians were vocal in their condemnation. In the elections called by Reich Chancellor Bülow in the face of this storm of criticism, elections labeled in the press the Hottentot elections, social democratic papers condemned what they called the way our uh, national honor is preserved in uh, Africa. Supporters of the government reposted by suggesting that if the socialists triumphed, the Africans would destroy German settlements and kill the colonists while the government uh, was defending them and would keep, create a peaceful and prosperous Southwest Africa. Though one to judge from the picture on the right uh, without any Africans. So you can see them putting up a monument there. That's in the socialists on the left there. That's what would happen. Violence, Africans killing Germans. On the right, peaceful settlement, lots of nice palm trees and plants, um, and, uh, and no natives. It urged the electorate, as it said, to vote for the honor of the fatherland against its destroyers. The civilian governor of the colony, Theodor Leutwein, elbowed aside by the military because 
whose policy was compromise of the Herreros, <coughs> protested to Bulow about the action and declared the extermination a grave mistake. He was simply sacked for his pains. But his view that the Herrero should be recruited as laborers instead of being exterminated won sufficient adherence to bring about the arrest of the remainder of the tribe, mostly women and children, along with those uh, of the Nama tribe who joined the uprising, and their incarceration in concentration camps, indeed the first official German use of this term. It's a rather sort of fuzzy photograph, contemporary photograph of the concentration camp on Shark Island, which is a rocky terrain off the Namibian coast, where the prisoners were used as forced laborers, fed, fed on minimal rations, exposed to bitter winds without adequate clothing, and beaten with leather whips if they failed to work hard enough. Everyday bodies were taken to the beach and left for the tide to wash out into the shark-infested waters. Even the South African press complained about the horrible cruelty of the camp regime. And the camps also became the sites of scientific investigation, as the anthropologist Eugen Fischer, later to become a leading so-called racial hygienist under the Third Reich, descended on the town of Rehobot to study its mixed-race inhabitants, whom he called, rather unflatteringly, the Rehobot bastards. He got skulls from Shark Island for craniometrical measurements of uh, different racial groups, and up to 3,000 of these human remains eventually uh, found their way back to Germany. It's uh, labeled a box with Herrero skulls. Fisher concluded that mixed race offspring of Boers, or German settlers, and black Africans were inferior to the former, but superior to the latter. He thought they were suitable for recruitment, kind of non-commissioned officer class in the police, postal service, or other arms of the state. As a useful, if inferior race, they should be protected, unlike the Herero and the Nama. But the law in German Southwest Africa followed Trotter's belief that Africans were subhumans and his almost pathological fear that racial mixing would spread disease. In 1905, German Southwest Africa, after the uprising was over, interracial marriages were banned. In 1907, existing interracial marriages in Southwest Africa were legally annulled by the state. And these measures also introduced the term Rassenschande, racial defilement, into German legal terminology. It was, of course, the surface 30 years later in the Third Reich's Nuremberg Laws. A different legal status was ascribed to the German settlers and the rest of the population, allowing the Herrera men to be conscripted for forced labor. And here you can see them in chains being dragged off to do some work. They also had to wear identification tags, another measure later applied by the Nazis to the Jews. So the Herrera population, estimated at 85,000 before the war, was reduced to 15,000 by the end while up to 10 out of the 20,000, 10,000 out of 20,000 Nama were exterminated. And of some 17,000 Africans incarcerated in the concentration camps, about half survived. And given Trotter's racial beliefs and his explicitly racially motivated policy, there's little doubt that this is what would later come to be termed a genocide. Well, quite apart from this genocidal war, violence is a constant feature of German rule in many different colonies. German East Africa, for example, continual military clashes, many of them set off by the unscrupulous colonial adventurer Karl Peters, who I talked about in an earlier lecture, drew the imperial government in Berlin to take over the colony's administration in 1891. But armed conflict continued. No fewer than 61 major penal expeditions, as they were called, were launched in the following six years alone. In 1905, conflicts over land seizures, taxation rises, and forced labor requirements led to the Maji Maji uprising. Here you have a picture of its leader, German East Africa. Um, a Maji Maji uprising which, uh, which, um, uh, in which about 80,000 Africans were killed by the German military. But in contrast to Southwest Africa, this is not seen as a racial war by the Germans. In fact, um, many of the casualties were inflicted by African troops in German uniform, so-called Askaris. The devastation was enormous, with more than 200,000 Africans perishing from the famine caused by the destruction of rebel fields and villages by the German forces. While German colonial postcards for use back home portrayed peaceful scenes in which Africans put up admiring portraits of Bismarck on the left there, and 
squatted deferentially before the German flag on the right there, uh, both of these in the German colony of, uh, of Cameroon. Um, but, uh, of course, even in the background, force was never far away. You can see on the right there are soldiers posted to, go, to guard the German flag from insult or attack. Um, the officially recorded number of beatings, public beatings of Africans, almost certainly an underestimate, rose in Cameroon from 315 in 1900 to 4,800 in 1913. African rulers actually took their case to the German Reichstag, the parliament, but the governor's subsequent dismissal, in fact, had more to do with the objections of traders and missionaries to its policy of granting big land concessions to planters than with the brutality of its rule. The situation reached a crisis point at the end of German rule uh, when a former paramount chief in Cameroon was publicly executed for objecting to racial segregation in the main town, Douala. His funeral, shown here, attracted large crowds and became itself uh, as something of a kind of demonstration of uh, resistance. These acts reflected in the end, I think, the continuing fragility of German control. Experiences and techniques of rule obviously differed between colonies of settlement, where substantial numbers of Europeans emigrated to establish themselves in a climate and under conditions favorable to a European style of life, and what have been called colonies of occupation, where the climate and the terrain as in Cameroon, were only suitable for low levels <coughs> of emigration and settlement. In the Cameroon, in fact, tropical diseases and uh, the density of the rainforest limited settlers to just a few hundred. The relative strength, degree of organization and military preparedness of the indigenous societies also played a role. Loosely organized nomadic herdsmen like the Herero were in the end easier to defeat than settled and elaborately structured social and political systems like those of the Islamic states that stretch across northern Cameroon and over into the north of British colonies like Nigeria. And the numbers in these colonies of occupation are very striking. So in German East Africa, for example, there are 415 colonial officers and administrators supposedly controlling 10 million Afri Africans and Arab traders. German banknotes were printed, but really only used in uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, there were only 30 German military stations in the colony. They depended for their effectiveness in the end, in other words, on the cooperation of local Arab, uh, African leaders. Now, the German officers, of course, choose who to cooperate with. During his 20-year term of office in Togo, one regional official dismissed 544 chiefs in his district and replaced them with ones he thought were more cooperative, though often they weren't. In northern Cameroon, the Islamic Fulbi aristocracy, once they'd been brought under German control by a series of military expeditions, actually used German forces then to extend their own area of influence. So uh, there's a kind of effective joint rule. And given their small numbers in comparison to those of the Africans, the Germans could only hope to establish what have been called islands of power in their colonies. German propaganda here portrayed happy colonies where Africans tried to imitate European ways or reverted to their own primitive customs and beliefs. But there's never any doubt that the Germans thought that Africans were inferior beings and they knew it. Nowhere did Africans wholly accept the legitimacy of German sovereignty and their effective exclusion from participation in the public sphere, public life of the colonies doomed German rule always to appear as alien rule. And the same is the case in other German colonies too, even in the treaty port of Zhaozhou with its modern facilities and education for the Chinese. A, uh, we've got a postcard here that shows a classic image of the German attitude towards the Chinese in the, in the colony, He's sitting on one and using the back of another to write his postcard. How did all this compare with other colonial powers? Did they too use this kind of violence to conceal their inability to establish full control? Did they commit massacres to impose their will on the colonized? The largest of the European empires of the British is so uh, diverse that generalizations, contemporary map here, um, British possessions colored red, as you can see, um, is, um, uh, it's very difficult to generalize about it. Well, you can say the British Empire has always run on decentralized lines. Westminster law was ultimately supreme, but there's no attempt to 
impose a uniform system of rule from London. There actually, there's even every different agencies in London responsible for different parts of the empire. The foreign office, the protectorates, the colonial office, to which ultimately in the end, after a long period of time, the protectorates were assigned, and the India office, special office for India. And before the First World War, the colonial office was run by politicians who had little real knowledge of the colonies. And this gave a lot of power to civil servants, but they too were too busy to involve themselves <coughs> in the minutiae of administrative affairs in their separate colonies. And the insistence of, on free trade through the empire made central control even less necessary. So huge power devolved to the colonial state and its representatives on the ground. Major parts of the empire <coughs> had been in British possession long before the scramble for Africa. And here we have the classic colonies of settlement, uh, notably, I mean, mostly the African colonies, uh, with partial exceptions like German South West Africa, uh, were colonies of occupation. Uh, but here there's the uh, uh, colonies of settlement, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and to a considerable degree also South Africa. While there's European settlement in, also in Algeria, the French colony of Algeria, um, uh, and as I said, South West Africa, these colonies, these British colonies are unique and being almost purely designed as colonies, as goals for emigration. Millions left Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales for new homes overseas, especially in times of economic hardship like the hungry 40s. Government gave little help except briefly in the 1820s. Its major contribution was the funding, founding of a distinctive kind of settler society in Australia through the transportation of more than 130,000 convicts up to 1868. So not advisable when you have to fill in a, a form if you're uh, emigrating to Australia where it says, uh, do you have any criminal, collect, uh, criminal convictions uh, to put the classic answer, didn't know it was still necessary. Um, <laughs> that gave Australian settler society with re convicts released um, after having suffered to considerable suffering and brutality, uh, a particularly violent edge, I think. Well, many emigrants, of course, huge numbers went to the USA, but Australia, New Zealand, and Canada had private settlement companies encouraging emigration from the British Isles, smoothing the way for emigrants by colonizing land and selling it cheaply to them. The main proponent of this was Edward Gibbon Wakefield, who founded a number of colonizing companies, uh, notably in uh, New Zealand, uh, to attract a New Zealand company, to attract, to see the lower classes here uh, for cheap uh, emigration, uh, well uh, funded and backed by the company. With his followers, Wakefield persuaded the British government that these colonies could support themselves economically and were creating a new British society abroad uh, in areas suitable, crucially, of course, for British exports. As these societies took shape and contour through the 19th century, the system of representative colonial self-government familiar from 18th century America was extended to them as well. And the move was prompted by a report by Lord Durham in 1839 following armed uprisings in Canada two years before. These had been caused by the resentment of the French minority that considered itself disfranchised and the hostility shown to the royal authority, the governor, by large numbers of recent immigrants from the USA. Twelve rebels had been hanged, uh, 1,700 had been arrested, and uh, hundreds had fled to the USA. And as a result of these conflicts was the, uh, the Durham Report, which recommended colonial self-government with colonial parliaments and colonial ministries. Uh, and this became really the basis for the British imperial administration of colonies which had a majority of European and especially British settlers. The disqualified colonies where settlers were in a minority like the West Indies um, uh, had a different system. India was different again. Uh, but by the late 19th century, self-administration had been extended to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Cape Colony and South Africa. Partly because the British government in London didn't want to bear the cost of wars against uh, people like the Maoris or the uh, Zulus. Voting rights, of course, are confined to the white minority. Well, how far was violence involved in the establishment of the settler colonies? To a large extent, in Canada, as before uh, in the Americas, the settlers' work was done for them by disease. When Scottish settlers, led by Lord Selkirk, arrived at Assimbois, in Manitoba in 1816, they were confronted by local Indians, they called them, who feared the inroads that the settlers might make into their fur trading, 
and killed the governor and 22 Europeans in the so-called Battle of Seven Oaks, forcing them to withdraw. Selkirk came back in 1817 with a group of fully armed ex-soldiers as settlers, and they re-established the colony. But the success was not just due to their preparedness, but also to their introduction, no doubt involuntary, of smallpox in the earlier expedition. A German traveler in the 1830s recorded the whole area, as, see, I'm quoting here, covered with unburied corpses. The local Indians, 9,000 strong, had spread pestilence and famine and were nearly exterminated. And he noted they, as well as the crows and the Blackfeet, endeavored to flee in all directions, but the disease everywhere pursued them. As in the German colonies, so too in British settler colonies, there was constant low-level, small-scale, but often deadly violence, meted out, however, more often by settlers than by colonial troops. As the settlers fenced off land, claiming Australia as vacant possession, uh, nomadic Aborigines began to retaliate for the loss of their traditional uh, areas of hunting and gathering food. Aboriginal attacks on sheep stations in the Bathurst area and the Hunter Valley west of Sydney in 1824, led the governor of New South Wales, General Sir Thomas Brisbane, after whom the city of Brisbane was named, to impose martial law, allowing ranchers to shoot Aborigines on sight, sent out a squad of 24 mounted police to wreak revenge. A critical missionary, Lancelot Threlkeld, reported a large number were driven into a swamp, and mounted police rode round and round and shot them off indiscriminately till they were all destroyed, men, women, and children. The squad collected 45 skulls from the corpses, boiled them down, and had them taken back to England by their commanding officer as trophies. Best thing that could be done, Threlkeld reported a local rancher as saying, best thing that could be done was to be shoot all the blacks and manure the ground with their carcasses, which is all the good they're fit for. The women and children should especially be shot as the most certain method of getting rid of the race. One of the relatively few, uh, few actions in which concerted government's uh, uh, manoeuvres were taken against Aborigines was in Tasmania. Initially, the governor attempted to show the Aborigines that they would receive equal justice to the settlers. So this proclamation from 1815 showing graphically how if uh, an Aborigine killed a white man, he would be hanged, but the reverse, if a white man killed an Aborigine, he would be hanged. But this uh, really was um, a dead letter. Uh, clashes continued between settlers and farmers and Aborigines in Tasmania, till in 1830, Governor George Arthur gathered 3,000 Europeans, including 1,000 soldiers and 700 convicts on parole, paid for, uh, he managed to get them paid for by the British Treasury, to form a black line across the country to drive the Aborigines south onto the Tasman Peninsula, south of Hobart. By this time, the original Aboriginal population of 7,000, estimated in 1800, had been reduced to a few hundred by sporadic violence and again, particularly by the introduction of European diseases to which they had no resistance. This remainder, Arthur said, would murder every white inhabitant if they could do so with safety to themselves. This is actually very much an initiative of the island settlers, the local administration. The colonial secretary in London, General Sir George Murray, refused to send out troops to uh, help in the enterprise, commenting, the extinction of the native race will leave an indelible stain on the character of the British government. Except for one small group of five Aborigines caught asleep and shot, the rest uh, of them uh, fled through the dense bush and the line failed to find any at all. But by 1834, the remaining 200, told they'd be given their lands back and reunited with their families, surrendered, seen here in a rather idealized painting from 1840. The promises were uh, lies. They were transported instead to Flinders Island, where so many died that the remaining 47 were taken back to Oyster Cove in Tasmania. The last surviving Aboriginal died in 1905 and uh, the language with her. Massacres of Aborigines were part of the disorderly history, early history of modern Australia, often carried out by freed convicts. The state was keen to impose order. And after the notorious massacre of 30 Aborigines by a gang of former convicts at Mile Creek in 1838, seven of the ex-convict perpetrators were convicted and hanged, though it was reported they all stated that they thought it extremely hard that white men should be put to death for killing blacks. <coughs> 
The massacre prompted the government of New South Wales to reject the idea that it should, as it said, abandon all control over these distant regions and leave the occupiers of them unrestrained in their lawless aggression upon each other and upon the Aborigines. It created a border police force whose aim, however, was mainly to protect ranchers against Aborigine attacks. A small scale, often individual killings continued, but government control was more or less established by mid-century. And again, the main damage to the indigenous population in Australia was done by disease. As an estimated population, it's always very difficult, but uh, it's something like half to three quarters of a million Aboriginals uh, in 1788, uh, declining to 72,000 in 1921. It's been slowly recovering since then. Where the British confronted not nomadic hunter-gatherers in a sparsely populated country, but settled farmers on rich agricultural land, as in South Africa, the situation was much more complex. In the Cape Colony, Boer farmers of Dutch descent bitterly resented the abolition of slavery by the British government in 1834, and the small compensation paid to them for the loss of their slaves. Khosa land to the east of the colony was impounded by the governor to distribute to former slaves. And on 21st of September, of December 1834, a Khosa army invaded and claimed it back, killing British and Boer settlers too. Governor Durban then <coughs> declared, uh, that's another man after whom a town was named, declared the Khosa had to be exterminated, an emotive word that earned him a lot of criticism back uh, in Britain. Another British officer spoke of the necessity of exterminating from off the face of the earth the race of monsters. The Khosa chief was shot and his ears removed by soldiers as trophies. But Khosa resistance was fierce and after several months a compromise was reached, brokered by a new liberal government in London, appalled by Durban's activities and terrified of the massive cost of continuous warfare in the Cape. The British withdrew and left the Khosa uh, with their land. Appalled by this retreat by the British government, 5,000 Boer farmers expressed their lack of confidence in the British Empire by migrating northwards between 1835 and 1837 in what became known as the Great Trek. It's a rather romantic painting of a Boer family on the trek making camp. Violent clashes with the Zulus and Ndebele ensued. 135 trekkers reportedly shooted a small army of several thousand Ndebele warriors in 1837, causing the Ndebele to migrate northwards. In 1838, Zulus killed Dutch settlers who'd moved onto their land threatened British settlements as well. In December, the Boers retaliated by slaughtering 3,000 Zulu warriors at the Battle of Blood River, which was indeed made a South African public holiday in the 1920s. The prospect of a turbulent and independent Boer province on the borders of the Cape was too much for the British authorities. By 1843, the new Boer province of Natal had been incorporated into the empire. And as British plantations were founded, clashes between the British and the Boers on the one hand and the Zulus on the other hand uh, began to intensify. Uh, this culminated in the British decision to annex Zululand in 1879. And the Zulu, well-organized martial uh, society, uh, resisted. And at the Battle of Zandalwana, the British invading force was heavily defeated. Though, as you'll know, if you know that famous film with Michael Caine called Zulu, uh, at Rourke's Drift, an outpost held off another Zulu force. Still, the army had to retreat, suffering further losses. A second, stronger invasion force finally defeated the Zulus and established British control, which broke up the Zulu kingdom into a number of much smaller and more manageable units. A decade earlier, in 1869, the situation in South Africa had been dramatically changed when diamonds had been discovered at Kimberley. And in 1886, illustrating, I think, the kind of global nature of the British Empire, was actually an Australian prospector who discovered gold on the Witfortis Rand. And within a few years, hundreds of thousands of immigrants had arrived from all over the world looking for gold creating a wild boom town of Johannesburg. In these circumstances, the stakes were now much higher. 
And the Boers began to organise to, uh, keep the, to get rid of the, the British control. In 1881, a Boer force defeated the British at the Battle of Majuba Hill and re-established the independence of the Boer Republic of the Transvaal, uh, which had been annexed by the British five years before. The Republic of the Transvaal was made rich by the gold mines, but of course the wealth went either to international businessmen or the magnates known locally as the Rand Lords. They didn't go to the mass of poor uh, Boer farmers in the countryside. By the 1890s, the huge wealth of the gold and diamond mines was proving irresistible to the British and to that Southern African uh, colonialist Cecil Rhodes. When the British rejected a demand for voting rights, sorry, when the Boers rejected the demand for voting rights in the Transvaal to be extended to the non-Boers in the, in the state in 1899, the British invaded. It's an early Boer counter-offensive against Natal and the Cape defeated by British troops under Lord Roberts, which relieved the besieged towns like Mafeking, and in 1900 finally occupied the main Boer towns, including the capital, Pretoria. So here we are now in the age of high imperialism. The stakes are increased. The state uh, has taken a much bigger role. Earlier in the century, British state, the, uh, em the empire, uh, the governments in London were very reluctant to get involved uh, in uh, in these, these events such as these, the, uh, much of the initiative was left to uh, locals, local farmers, local settlers. But now, in the age of high imperialism at the end of the 19th century, especially when gold and diamonds were at stake, the British didn't hesitate to send in a large military force. The capture of the main Boer towns is not the end of the Boer War. For another two years, the Boers continued the war in a series of guerrilla campaigns, which led the new British commander, Lord Kitchener, systematically to destroy Boer farms and set up 45 concentration camps for Boers, mainly women and children, along lines used by US forces in the Philippine-American War about the same time, pioneered by the Spanish in Cuba in the 1870s. 25,000 Boer soldiers were deported overseas as prisoners of war. Both sides used large numbers of black soldiers, often forgotten in accounts of the clash of the war. The British set up 64 concentration camps for black families, too. A total of 28,000 Boer, uh, Boers, mostly children, died of disease, exposure, and malnutrition in the tented camps. It just this consists of temp tents, as you can see here. It's a death rate about one in four. Of the <coughs> 107,000 black Africans in the camps, about 14,000 are known to have died, probably more. There were no basic medical facilities. The administration was chaotic and inefficient. Uh, the camps were death traps. The intent behind them, however, was military. It wasn't genocidal. Neither Kitchener nor his officers regarded the Boers, in particular, as an inferior race worthy only of extermination. Seems to have gone wrong, it's simply a matter of neglect and lack of resources in the administration of the camps. Still, liberal critics like Lloyd George strongly condemned what he called a policy of extermination. And the, camp, uh, the camps left a legacy of bitterness that helped ensure that the Boers did not take kindly to subsequent British attempts to make English the only officially permitted language in South Africa. The British established a federation of colonies and republics in the Union of South Africa in 1909, along similar lines to the Federation of States set up in Australia. Like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, South Africa became a self-governing dominion. Neither black Africans nor many immigrant Indian workers had equal rights. Already restricted, in 1905, the voting rights of black Africans were abolished altogether, and they were restricted to reserves, which they needed an official pass to leave. Indians, denied the vote since the early 1890s, also had to carry a pass. In 1913, black Africans outside the Cape were restricted to owning land within their so-called original tribal homes, amounting altogether to 7% of the Union's land, and the legal basis for the policy of apartheid uh, or separate development after 1945, uh, seen in these two pictures, uh, was already laid effectively before 1914. Now, in a sense, the Boer War was the final phase of the scramble for Africa. The other major territories administered, acquired by the 
uh, obtained by the British Empire in the scramble were very different. They didn't have any formal self-government, legislative assemblies or voting rights. They're not colonies of settlement, they're colonies of occupation. Very few white settlers in them, though some British possessions in East Africa had a significant number, but still not overwhelmingly large. Palm oil, hardwood, ivory, cocoa, groundnut, cotton production began to make the new West African colonies economically significant. The East African colonies from Egypt southwards were mainly of significance in protecting the route to India through the Suez Canal. And apart from a small number of states like Zanzibar, Brunei, Tonga, Malaya, most importantly Egypt, uh, these new possessions of the British Empire did not retain indigenous rulers that were directly controlled by the colonial office. Land seizures by colonists were of relatively limited importance given their limited numbers in areas, particularly in West Africa, commonly known as the white man's grave. As the British Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, said in 1897 in a speech on British colonization in tropical Africa, the objects we have in our view are strictly business objects. We wish that trade should pursue its unchecked and unhindered course upon the Niger, the Nile, and the Zambezi. And like Bismarck, in other words, Salisbury, along with other British prime ministers of the age, wanted colonization to be carried out by chartered companies and not the state. So it was, for example, the Royal Niger Company that led the way in colonizing what later became known as Nigeria. It signed 237 separate treaties with local rulers between December 1884 and uh, October 1886 alone. The chiefs made over usually their land and legal authority to the company in return for being allowed to mine and farm and maintain their own laws. The company for its part declared it had no desire to interfere more than is absolutely necessary with the internal arrangements of the chiefs of Central Africa, to quote one of these treaties. These arrangements proved not much more permanent in the British than they had been in the German case. And here we have the figure of Joseph Chamberlain, he became colonial secretary in 1895, a far more thoroughgoing imperialist than his prime minister, Lord Salisbury. Chamberlain was not satisfied with the loose treaty-based arrangements by which these new African parts of the empire were ruled. British interests had to be asserted more powerfully. In West Africa, the Ashanti, as I've said, had fought a long series of wars against the encroachments of the British. It only ended in the mid-90s with the occupation of the Ashanti capital. Already in 1897, a British force sacked Benin and looted uh, thousands of artifacts following the killing of an embassy uh, sent uh, upriver to open up trade with the local rulers. The powerful and still slave-owning Muslim emirs of northern Nigeria needed bringing to heel in Chamberlain's view. In 1900, a West African frontier force was created that waged a series of small military campaigns against them until they gave in to British demands. The previous year, a Royal Navy force bombarded <coughs> and machine-gunned the port in Zanzibar, killing or wounding 500 people to express British disapproval of the fact that the Sultan's nephew had declared himself ruler on his uncle's death without first seeking permission of the British consul. Here's the actual photograph uh, of the, uh, some of these events. In 1898, the Battle of Omdurman asserted British control over the Sudan in what's been called the most one-sided encounter in, in military history. As Hilaire Belloc put it, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. A book published in London in 1896 declared that when fighting against savages, mere victory is not enough. The enemy must not only be beaten, he must be beaten thoroughly. What is wanted is a big casualty list. So, Violence, my conclusion, is that it, violence lay at the heart of the British as well as the German Empire. But in neither case could it be aimed at establishing total control over the colonies. It's not only too difficult, it's also too expensive. Where indigenous political structures existed, northern Nigeria, northern Cameroons, or in a very, very different way in South Africa, cooperation in the end was necessary in a degree of autonomous self-administration uh, had to be left uh, to the colonized. Might be, have to be on terms dictated by the colonizing power, but uh, and punitive uh, expeditions, as they were called, might be mounted to enforce these terms, but um, 
in everyday uh, life, uh, in everyday matters, uh, in Central, Western, Eastern Africa, the chiefs, regarded by the British and Germans increasingly as paid colonial officials, ran their own affairs, kept their own laws and traditions. The British had to, in the end, allow the Boers a lot of their own way, even after the Boer War. The colonies, the colonizers could only establish then islands of power or a limited degree of control. In many instances, Violence is initiated on the ground <clears throat> without reference to London or Berlin, frequently arousing strong disapproval in the, uh, in the, the um, imperial capitals. Colonists in particular are ruthless in inserting what they thought of their, their rights to land and in their interests over those of indigenous peoples. And the colonized state found itself caught between the perceived need to protect them and disapproval of their frequent excesses. A racist belief in European superiority underpinned the imperial empire, uh, enterprise in both Britain and Germany and in the colonies and had explicit legal consequences in areas of European settlement. But economic interests were paramount, whether it's trade or plantations or settler farms. Looking at the comparison, it does seem to be the case that the German empire was more systematically racist than the British and to have been more prepared to engage in ruthless campaigns of racial warfare and ex extermination. But in some ways, the Herero uh, campaign in Southwest Africa was an exception. The differences were of degree rather than of kind. Yet, of course, the British Empire was a lot older than the German. It encompassed many more varied parts of the globe. It lasted a lot longer. Some of the colonies had been uh, in British hands for over a century by the time of the scramble for Africa. By far the most important of these was India. This is a very different world from that of uh, the African colonies. I'll turn to India in my next lecture and also take a look at some of the other empires, most notably the Belgian, by way of comparison. The history of empire is not just the history of European control over other parts of the world. It's also the history of economic exploitation. In the fifth lecture of this series, I'll argue that economic exploitation led with other influences, above all after the First World War, to European powers beginning to see the advantages of encouraging economic development and modernization in their overseas colonies. As part of this mission, the so-called white man's burden became a burden not of conquest and control uh, or of violence and suppression, but of education and improvement. Colonial violence could not in continue indefinitely. It was arousing increasing criticism in Europe itself even before the First World War and above all afterwards. And what the consequences of this were, I shall explore in my next lecture, which will be on the penultimate day of February, which this year is the 28th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you're, in your talk, you would, uh, your analysis of the German Empire shows that you clearly feel that a lot of these traits of the, German, of the German Empire were pointing quite directly to, to the Third Reich. Um, I'm wondering, do you think, obviously there were some traits in um, the German which um, came out as the Third Reich developed, but I mean, do you think that this kind of treatment of Africans, etc., was pointing directly towards um, the concentration camps, etc.? Yes, uh, excellent question. Um, I actually have an article about this coming out in the next issue of the London Review of Books. Um, but here let me just say, there, there is, of course, there are historians who argue that, that. There's a direct line between the genocide in South Africa and the Holocaust. But it's actually rather difficult to, to, to show that. Uh, if you, you can pick out a few individuals, prominent in both, Hermann Goering's father was the uh, first governor of South West Africa. Uh, the character like Franz Ritter von Epp, uh, who's in South West Africa, becomes a big... Uh, figure in the Third in the Third Reich. Uh, I mentioned Fischer, who is this uh, eugenicist who began his career in South West Africa. But on the other hand, there's a very small number of, of, of personal continuities, uh, and the vast majority of leading Nazis had no role in the colonies beforehand. Nazis actually didn't think the colonies were very important. They thought that Europe was the place where you needed to invade, um, at least to begin with. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, of course, the ideology. There's only bits of the ideology there. The, um, you could argue uh, that uh, in South West Africa, it's it's a mixture of racism and a Prussian military tradition of annihilating the enemy. 
um, the, uh, it basically took the First World War in the Weimar Republic to turn even the people who'd been in South West Africa, like Epp, into Nazis. Uh, they weren't ready-made Nazis in, before the First World War. And there's no equivalent in South West Africa of a camp like Treblinka, solely devoted to nothing but killing people. Um, there's always a mixture of the idea of, of, of labor, uh, and, uh, but labor under, under harsh conditions. Um, in in South West Africa, so um, it's a very it's an interesting an interesting debate that's ongoing amongst, amongst historians. I'm slightly sceptical, but you can certainly see some, if you like, adumbrations, some foreshadowing of of, of the Nazi experience. It's only 30 years later. Well, I think that's probably the last question. Well, thank you very much for those interesting questions. I shall hope to see you at the next lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.